Welcome back to the pain train. <laughs> choo choo. We're back from a, a lunch break where I had a chocolate shake and whatnot and we're recovered and things. And you kept saying something that I thought was interesting because you kept repeating that they didn't have enough time together. Yes. Like very specifically. And uh, what what came to mind there is just the fact like in my in my essay for B Stars, I specifically said the phrase that which I said I which I said I learned from this game was essentially the idea that like if I keep waiting for the world to feel ready for me, I'll just die in the closet. Like this idea that you just, there's, there is no like correct time. Like you just kind of have to go. And like this entire game was just a series of events of them, like sort of running out the clock and like not really getting the chance to be what they wanted to be for each other and so on. And, and then like, he has that realization of like his, his last interaction with Amicus may have been, him just hugging him for a second and shouting all the things that are happening and like these kinds of like fucked up moments. Oh, it's such a, it's like such a classic tragic romance story where it's like there's few people who are uh, wanting to be together or destined to be together, but it's just undercut constantly by other people yeah. who feel the need to like interject with their own like issues or, you know, like their, their own motives and politics and things like that. And so I think it's like it's such a it's a classic trope of media involving like tragic couples to basically have such a limited amount of time together where it's like, oh, we, you know, we could have had a wonderful rest of our lives, but everyone had to get in the way of that. That, that, that to me is always the saddest aspect of, of these things. It's not as if like they would have had issues or they wouldn't have gotten along. I mean, granted, we, we don't know for sure, but it's just the fact that other, it's other third party people that prevent this from working out the way yeah. that they want it to. It just it doesn't like it doesn't seem fair, as as Marco was saying. It really isn't fair at all because it's it could have worked out perfectly fine. And it's extremely fitting for a gay story because that's like so much of the, just, the reality the world, and the narrative yeah. of what you deal with is that so much of you, so many of the obstacles are just these outside forces that have no business being there, but they are. And it's exhausting. And uh, yeah, like the. Like the, then there's the constant idea of like running out of time and and like and like not lo not missing your chance again and so on like to the point where that was Amicus's reaction when like like there was they when the one time they've had sex which was basically them just grinding on each other uh, it was after Marco had literally already died and been brought back and amicus was this drunk horrible mess and they're both gross and they just fucking they just take a shower and then they <laughs> fuck because like amicus was like i'm not he's, he's like i'm not missing that chance again and he was right because literally hours later they're right back to being separated and imprisoned and that was this whole path that led here and there just was never a chance again and it's like it's just a nightmare you also said something fucking ruthless <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, you said, uh, that you, you don't, I, I, I you don't, said, <laughs> I don't necessarily want Cassius to die, but I want, I kind of want Cassius to die because I want Alex to lose something. <laughs> <laughs> specifically, I want Alex to have lost something. <laughs> it's like, Jesus <laughs> Christ. Because I, because I, <laughs> Stephanie's pissed. <laughs> I feel that even if he were just executed, it would not be enough to, it would not be enough penance for all the havoc he's caused. Every single person in this entire story has You want to see his life. gifts turn to ash in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> what, his, his silver tongue? Uh, it's, it's, it's like some Game of Thrones quote. I don't remember the context. Uh, it's the Cersei Lannister. Uh, she has a, there's a prophecy that all of her children will die and so on. And I think the phrase, something about turning to ash in her mouth, like is mentioned in there. And that sticks with me. I was thinking a uh, silver tongue turned to rust. Yeah. Because, I mean, he definitely does have a silver tongue. It's like, that was his that was his winning element. That little fucker. So welcome to the <laughs> void. You've been looking forward to <laughs> all your life. I've been here all along. <laughs> uh, that was rough. All right. It's still rough to say. I don't know if it was... I don't know if it would have hit me the same way the second time normally. But having to read it is really rough. But definitely when the screen faded to black and I realized the next screen was going to be Amicus's face, I'm like, I'm not ready for this part. <laughs> I'm not ready for this screen to come up when, it, when it's going to come up in a minute. I, I was not that happy. It makes perfect sense. I, I, th I think that like saying something is when you say something out loud, it, even if it's something you're reading something, it is actively involving you. There's a part of your brain that I think flicks on in relationship to like it, it's pertaining to you in a certain yeah. way. I like 
songs. I like sing a certain line and I'm just like, <laughs> it's just, I could look at it on paper, but me saying it is me is involving me. Yeah. You know, it's more personal. I, th- I think reading this kind of stuff out loud makes it a lot harder. I totally get it. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's songs where you sing them out loud. They're like way harder to get through. Like, what is it? Fucking <laughs> hurt by Johnny Cash. <laughs> <laughs> even, or even I get to buy by a, uh... Honest Bob and the Factory to Dealer Incentives Every is like time I see her it is face, harder to get through it, if you say it all out I'll loud. Never touch it, I especially like the final, like the final rant at the end and so on. It's like mm, this is grim, actually. Oh, man, not to, I'm not going to go on a tangent, but A to J has a song called uh, "Black Dog," and that song makes me fucking cry yeah. my eyes out. They have a whole bunch, but that one really, really gets me. Everybody says to just toe the line. And everybody says that I'll be fine. And everybody tells me that the world is there for me to play in, but I don't believe them. It's like, oh no. <laughs> this song is hard to get through all of a sudden. Uh. Amicus is the victor. All hail Emperor Amicus. It's not important right now, Kong. <laughs> <laughs> the words sound hollow in Amicus's ears. And so does the faint roar of the crowds in Ad Astrid City, all the way across the lake. The wolf can only stare down at the human in his arms, suddenly realizing how light and fragile he actually is. And the blood. So much blood that paints the front of this human that just moments ago had been full, so full of life. A tear drops from the tip of Amicus's nose and onto Marco's neck, mixing with the blood that has now stopped flowing from the deep gash. Air no longer bubbles from through the red liquid either. A strange, choking sound works its way out of Amicus's lips, one he's never heard himself make before. The overflowing sadness in his heart has seemingly run out to be replaced with something empty, cold. Like there's nothing there anymore. Still, Amicus wills the human to live, to use those special healing abilities he seemed to possess to breathe again. But even as Virginia moves to find Felix, Amicus knows that nothing can be done for something like this. Kato had very nearly beheaded the human, cutting through everything everything that was important. Cradling Marco's head carefully, Amicus raises the young human up to his chest, hugging him tightly, squeezing his eyes shut and feeling the welling tears pour over his cheeks, down his chin, into the human's hair. It's quiet. And Amicus opens his eyes to see Neferu still sitting there in front of him, staring in shock. When the jackal meets his eyes, he quickly dips his head, lowering his ears. Amicus, I... I'm so sorry. The wolf raises his eyes to see a drone just over Neferu's head, hovering as its lens focuses voyeuristically on him, broadcasting his grief to Adastra. But this is nothing like those dramas, the tragedies of romantic death he'd seen played out on screen so many times before. There's nothing romantic about this, as Amicus is sure his audience is finding it to be right now. This is real death, and the feeling is familiar. It's hollow, empty, suffocating, like being pulled down into a bottomless cold black ocean. It's like when Mother died and Cassius had screamed over her body like a wounded animal. It's like when he heard the news father had died, and how he'd fallen to his knees, clutching his chest and gasping for air like he'd been shot. But this is worse somehow, and Amicus can't even comprehend it. It hits him harder than anything he's felt in his life. Everything is going gray, the color of being sucked from his vision, from his life. Even though he's not sobbing now, the tears are flowing freely down his cheeks. He isn't sure how he can recover from this at all. He knows he probably never will. This is his fault. He'd forced the human here. He'd made himself feel better by saying Marco had a choice in the matter, was free to do as he pleased. But that wasn't true at all. He'd taken the human's life, just as Kato had now. Amicus realizes that he is no different from the wolves he thought himself to be above. That he was more enlightened somehow in trying to hold all sapient life as equal. He's even worse. 
and even though it would break his heart never to have Marco, Amicus only wishes that he'd never been he never brought him here in the first place, to his death. The thought brings another wave of heart wrenching grief to crash through his hollow chest, and for a moment he can't he almost can't breathe. Please, Marco. The young wolf whispers into the human's air, hair, his voice now only a soft whine as fresh tears blur his vision. His teachings, since he was a pup, begin to come to mind. Marco's soul, like the soul of all sapients, is ascending to the greater intelligence, mingling with the lives of billions of others, with his father, his mother, maybe Cassius too, a place he'd also join one day. But... But the human soul belonged here, in his arms, not to be mixed and consumed by the parents, not yet. That mixed singular being isn't Marco. It's like a beautiful mural being shattered, then reconstructed into something else. Marco still exists. At this very moment, he exists, but it's no longer him. Amicus grits his teeth, feeling anger begin to overcome the overwhelming br grief. No. 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 How dare they? This isn't fair. The parents had spoken to Marco, had told him what to do, had led him to this point. When the human had told Amicus that he worried about something terrible happening, Amicus grits his teeth, remembering how he'd brushed it off, even though he told Marco that he believed him, that he'd have n nothing to worry about if he followed their guidance. No. Amicus shakes his head, still clutching onto the human tightly. Amicus? Nefera's voice is tentative, almost fearful, like he's worried about what Amicus might do. Amicus isn't even sure of that himself as he rises to his feet, cradling the human as one good arm, easily able to do so because of their difference in size. He turns and walks quiet, uh, quickly toward the palace, almost jogging ignoring the various jolts of pain throughout his body. He doesn't even glance down at Kato's unmoving body as he passes by. The wolf's expression is stoic now, a strange rage bubbling under the surface. Amicus! Nefero calls after him, but Amicus ignores the jackal, set on one thing and one thing only. The parents might have taken his parents, maybe even his brother, but they aren't going to take this human. He won't allow it. As the wolf enters the palace, he notices Alex pacing the hallway. He stops as he sees the wolf approaching. Amicus, I heard that you're emperor now, and... He trails off as he sees Marco cradled in the wolf's arm. The blood covering the body, flowing down a limply hanging arm to drip gently from his fingertips. Amicus brushes past the cat, eyes set ahead, straight ahead, expressionless. Nothing seems to exist outside of the wolf's tunnel vision. Soon he comes to the door he's looking for and leans forward, pressing his injured shoulder to the panel to open it, ignoring the blaze of pain that shoots through him as he does. Amicus approaches the archive, glaring at the orb, as if the machinery itself is the parents. The big wolf comes to stop in front of it, staring up at the glowing blue structure for a moment before looking down at Marco. The ashen color of the skin is unnerving, so different from the deep tones it once had. Marco is dead. Amicus knows that, but he won't accept it. The wolf presses his face close to the humans for a moment, feeling the fading warmth before kissing him gently on top of his head. With that, Amicus leans forward, pressing them both to the sphere. Then he connects, and he merges with the universe. We continue to drift through the infinite space, content. Despite everything, we trust the beings around us. All of us, and the others. The parents. The parents. This was all meant to happen. And though it was hard and terrible, the worst is now over. And that thought alone is enough to keep us completely relaxed. Waves and waves of relief washing over us. In the cacophony of thoughts and emotions, though, something stands out. 
though the beings meld together, one seems to become separate for a moment, solely to focus directly on us. On... me. This brings me out of my trance for a bit, and I turn my attention on them. Amicus? But then, I focus more on this being. I get a, comp I get a different feeling, not him, but her. It seems like she wants to speak to me. She's not familiar, not someone I've spoken to before. But the intensity of which she is focusing on me. Hello? I reach out, but then suddenly the amalgamation of intelligence begins to pull away, and I feel myself extracted from its mass. The feeling is bizarre, and I almost miss the crowding of thoughts and feelings of being one with many. But then I feel myself again, my body beginning to materialize out of nothing. The nothingness around me slowly becoming something. For a moment I'm floating in the air, then I'm being held by something strong and solid. The first thing I see is Amicus's face. He's looking down at me, grim and determined. Just as I focus on him, though, his expression changes. Marco? I shift a little, trying to focus better on my wolf. Marco! Suddenly I'm surrounded by fur, getting squeezed tight against Amicus, my face pressed into his neck. Instinctively I wrap my arms around him. Oh gods, are you real? Tell me you're real, Marco, please. He gasps the words like he's coming up for air after diving to the bottom of the lake. I'm having trouble remembering things, why he seems so upset. But I know something bad happened, and now it's over, so I try to, comf I try to comfort him. I'm real. I'm here. My voice is strange, like I haven't used it in a while. At first, I think I'm back in Amicus's room after I've woken up from the coma, still try to convince him that everything's okay. Like we'd gone to sleep and just woken up, and he wants to be reassured again that I'm not going to disappear. But then I remember that Kato came that morning. Things fall into place like a long row of giant, heavy dominoes. I suddenly sit up a bit, against Amicus's chest, pushing back so I can look up at him. Wait. The fight. Kato. Amicus, are you okay? I look over him, trying to check his wounds. The blood and swelling that I'd seen in the amphitheater's gone, though. He's clean and well-groomed, and his arm seems fine, judging by its sturdiness underneath me. My brief look at him has ended, though, as Amicus suddenly yanks me back against his chest, sobbing against me. I've seen Amicus cry before, back in the dungeons, but not these gut-wrenching sobs that I can feel heaving through my own body. It serves to shock me to my senses even more. Firmly, I push back against his chest, creating space so between us so that I can hold his face in my hands. He just looks back at me, crying openly and I watch as the tears well out of his eyes and seem to disappear into the fur of his cheeks. I'm sure we both want to say a lot in this moment. What happened? What's happening now? What will happen? But at this particular moment in time and space, we're back together. It's impossible, but it's happening. So I cling to him again, and he just holds me as I press my face against his chest, listening to his hammering heart, squeezing my eyes shut. If this is eternity, then I'm completely fine with it. I'm not sure how much time passes, but as this thought crosses my mind a few times, my, my eyes suddenly fly open. I press back again, looking up at the wolf, holding his face again. Wait, if you're here, did you... I wonder suddenly if maybe Amicus had been seriously wounded in the fight, that he didn't make it after all. But Amicus shakes his head gently, his sobs having quieted to subdued sniffles and hiccups. No. No, I'm fine. I won. Kato is dead. 
I'm flooded with relief. He strokes my head, my hair gently, slowly, and I wonder why he still looks so sad. But how are you here, aren't I? I look around at the infinite space surrounding us. The stars and planets are unusually close, stunningly bright and unimaginably vivid. The blues, purples, and blacks are deep and monolithic, signaling the endless space that stretches beyond. Am I dead? Amicus pulls me back against him, forcing me to look away from the churning universe. No. You're here. It sounds more like he's convincing himself, rather than me. But where's here? Amicus is quiet for a moment, and I find myself content to lean against him for a while, just wanting to be close to him. At some point Amicus had sat down, and I'm cradled in his lap. Considering we're not, ju we're not just floating around in zero gravity, I have to assume there's something solid underneath us, somehow. Amicus sniffles again. I melded my mind with the Archive to speak with the parents. That's all I know. I think. Did I do the same then? I was holding you when I did it. My neck. The blood. I look up at him again. Amicus, am I alive? Amicus looks at me for a moment before his face screws up and tears well up again. I... don't know. He winds out the words and I immediately hug him again. Hey. I'm okay, see? I'm here. Another sobbing fit starts. And now I know why. I must have died. And now, for whatever reason, the parents have let me let us reunite somehow. And I know that Amicus must be wondering the same thing that I am. How long is this going to last? I try to think of what to say, in case this is our last moment together. In case I'm going to be absorbed again. But my mind comes up short in the weirdest of ways, only able to think of things that don't matter. So I settle on what just happened. You're Emperor now, Amicus. Amicus nods against me, not trusting his voice at the moment, apparently. I'm so happy for you. Now he shakes his head, smearing tears against my cheek. I hate seeing him like this. I hate that this might be the last way that I'll see him. Please, don't cry. Let's just... be together right now. I sit up straight and pull his head against my chest for once, cradling his massive form against me, caressing his ears and neck. I'm okay, I promise you. I went somewhere when I... died. The word is so strange to say. It was really nice, full of people. I wasn't alone, it was peaceful. Amicus takes a deep, shuddering breath, finally pulling back from my hug. That's wonderful, Marco, but I'm sorry, because I'm not letting you go back there. Amicus suddenly looks resolute as he smirks through the tears. You're coming back with me. His voice breaks several times, and I can tell that he really means it. He really is certain that he's going to drag me back from the dimension of the dead. I don't know what to say. I don't know how I don't know much about the parents or the afterlife, but Amicus must, so I trust him. I smile up at him. Okay. He smiles back at me, then very suddenly kisses me. It's rough and wet. And kind of, he kind of misses my lips, but I kiss back, holding him tightly. Once he finally draws back, I'm happy to see my wolf back to his usual confident self, even if he has to keep sniffling with his runny nose. I look around at the swirling cosmos again. Um, 
Can you just get us out? Amicus frowns, looking around himself. Um, this is actually my first time doing this, so I'm not sure. Amicus looks behind us, then up and down, then clears his throat. Uh, calm? Calm, are you there? Silence. Hmm. I can tell that Amicus is already out of ideas. Oh. <laughs> All that determination. <laughs> it's very romantic, and he's an idiot. So. <laughs> the parents are doing this, right? I think so, though I've never spoken to them. You actually have more experience with that. Amicus grins at me, then looks back up. Maybe if we walk back... I give Amicus a strange look, and just as I'm about to point out the absurdity of walking back to Ad Astra through infinite space, a booming presence makes itself known. I suppose you are finished? Amicus and I both jump, and the wolf leaps to his feet, keeping me held in his arms. Who's there? Amicus shouts into the void, snarling. It's okay, Amicus, it's just the monitor. I say it like he's an old friend of mine. Amicus doesn't lower his guard, however, and he continues to growl into space. <laughs> the monitor expresses his amusement in that silent way of his, but I can understand why Amicus isn't letting his guard down. It's evident in the way he's holding me, clutching me tightly to his chest. He's afraid I'm going to be taken back from him. I am too. If you are, I'll open the channel of communication now. Amicus raises an eyebrow. What the hell are you talking about? You wish to speak with the parents, correct? They wish to speak directly with you, at least as directly as is possible. There's a pause, and I see the gears turning in Amicus's head as his eyes flick. Yes. Then it is done. The monitor's presence vanishes, and suddenly there's another one. Not one, but many, similar to what I had felt earlier. This is still different. Instead of melding together, these entities are distinct and separate from each other. But they're so similar that they could be copies of a single person. Their intentions feel disturbingly uniform, like they're all from on the exact same path. Unlike the Monitor, who at least felt to be on a similar level as any other sapient, these entities feel... alien. Which is a strange thing to feel after everything I've been through. But these things are so different. So... different. Well, show yourself. Amicus barks at the emptiness, somehow remaining brave in the face of all these titanic presences. You cannot see us. His mouth moves on its own, mind suddenly becoming empty, seeming to blend with the space around them. Amicus looks down at the human in confusion. What? He stares back. We cannot speak directly to you. Marco. But we have other methods. Amicus's face morphs from confusion to horror. Gods. Marco? He gives the human a little shake. Hey. He can hear you. He is simply occupied at the moment. Amicus bares his teeth and begins to shake. He's not sure if it's from anger or fear. Likely both. If you don't stop, there is no need to threaten. All is as it should be. Amicus is led to, left to stand there, staring open-mouthed at his lover. Something ominous and dark churns in his gut. This isn't how he'd envisioned any of this at all. These are the parents? What the hell are you? We are your guide, your benevolent leader, your parent. Amicus rubs a paw over the human's forehead, gently, looking into those blank, staring eyes. Leave him be, please. 
He is not being harmed. He shall return to a normal state after the channeling is complete. But how? Simply put, we are manipulating his behavior through the use of the lingua. <laughs> you called it really early that the lingua does more. Yeah. And that it's a tool of the parents. It's distressing. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> Amicus shakes his head, clearly not wanting this at all. But the complete powerlessness he feels right now, it's overwhelming. The speech had been planning for this moment. His intention to tear apart the careless arrogance of the parents, it just dissipates. Seeing Marco just taken by them like this, it's enough to completely cow any courage he'd once had. And as he stares at the cold eyes of the human, he begins to wonder if this is a nightmare. For a brief moment, Amicus wonders if any of this is real, what reality even is right now. That is not for you to wonder, Amicus. All that matters is that you are the one true Emperor. What do you want? Amicus stares down at his human, feeling repulsed by what's happening. For the work of Drusus to continue, for Adastra to achieve its full potential at last, for the Galaxias to ascend. Amicus shakes his head, trying to focus, trying not to focus on the robotic tone of Marco's voice, on the strange way his jaw moves, forced to speak like the woven tongue. I... I intend to do so, but please, let the human go and... and heal him. Please, he didn't ask for any of this. The human is also involved, Amicus. But I involved him. It was meant to be. What? Amicus isn't sure if it's his own mind or the mind of another b that brings back the memory of when he'd opened the archives, how Earth had been near the top of the list of profiled planets. How it made no sense that an uncontacted, uncontacted, bleh, uncontacted world would be on that list mm. at all. Interesting. But now it does make sense. But at the same time, even less sense. Amicus sh shakes his head, still reeling at the situation he's in, feeling like he's teetered on the edge of madness. Steady. There are many things you do not understand. Things that you will never understand. And that is fine. Not all things are meant to be understood by all sapiens. But you, are at le you at least understand that the humans are not uncontacted, are they? Amicus says nothing. Nothing that his mind is being read. Knowing that his mind is being read. Somehow, woven culture is there. So is Chemian culture. Hindo culture. All sibling cultures. The parents go silent and Amicus is left to stare at the puppet his lover had been turned into. Amic Amicus grits his teeth. Why? Because they were an experimental microcosm. Just a successful one. Uh, now a successful one. And it is time for them to be integrated into the, the Galaxias. Another moment of silence. And you want me to help do this? No. Your mission is to help unite the siblings. The first step is Chemia. That was already my intention. That is questionable. The situation is perilous. Chemia is furious after what has happened. You need more guidance. That's why you are here. Amicus snarls. I'm here for him. Amicus nods at Marco, at the sapient creature being used as a mouthpiece. You are here for the Galaxias, and as the Emperor, you now have the onus to see, uh, to know all this information, as your father knew, as his father knew, and so on. Amicus grits his teeth again, trying to comprehend what's being told to him despite being completely disturbed by what's happening to Marco. If you wanted a galactic integration, then why have we been competing with each other? This was assumed by the siblings themselves. Competition was never the goal. Then why not tell us that you're supposed to be our guide? The process is slow and careful. Interference is a last resort. This very communication is a last resort as the siblings and children stray further and further from the path every day, and not just the wolves. 
It has taken 20,000 years to reach this point, and that time cannot be wasted. Then why are you telling me, telling only me this and not all sapiens in the Galaxias? Amicus glares at the face of the human again, stroking the face gently, hating the blank stare he's receiving. As was stated, minimal interference will result in the best outcome. Only select figures are being informed at this stage. A Galaxias developed independent of interference will, ser will better serve the greater cause as a whole. The greater cause? The stars and planets shift around them, zooming forward, and for a moment Amicus feels as though he might be sick. Something dark looms on the edge of the universe, growing slowly, leeching the parts that it touches. The other approaches, and it must be confronted. At this point, Amicus feels unease pierce through his fog of confusion and anger. What other? Are we preparing for war against something? We must prepare for an event many millennia from now. This is one step of many. Amicus lets out a low growl of frustration, the vagueness of this entire situation making his head ache. But what does that have to do with Marco? Amicus shifts his hold on the human, just wanting him to come back to consciousness. He must play a role, and you must make a decision, Amicus. Everything seems to come together all at once for Amicus. All this talk of Drusus, of his and Marco's apparently fixed destinies. That decision that wolves fawned over for generations, no matter what opinion they held about Drusus himself. The choice offered by the parents to either save his empire or save his lover. I knew it. Yeah. I see cold fear and dread blooms in the pit of Amicus' stomach and slowly spreads throughout the rest of his body, seeming to leak like a frigid liquid down his groin and into his legs. The wolf feels his limbs tremble as he pulls the human closer to his chest, lips drawing back as instinct kicks in to protect his mate. For a long while, a length of time that's hard to discern, the wolf simply stares into the abyss. He looks up into the swirling stars, clouds, and planets, trying to see. Trying to see these things that are controlling and manipulating him and his lover. Trembling, Amicus shakes his head, taking another step back, away, even though the presence of the parents is all-encompassing. No. Amicus's jaw clenches, hating himself for sounding so weak and afraid. Remembering who he is, the wolf squares his shoulders, glaring up into space. No, I won't make such a decision. For once, the unseen place in which the parents reside is silent, but clearly observant. Amicus can feel the prickle of their all-seeing eyes on the nape of his neck. You... you hear me? I won't do it. I'll, I'll stay here forever if I have to. You can't involve us in this foolishness. Marco suddenly shifts in his grasp, his head turning awkwardly, leaning up in a strange way that seems unnatural as if pulled by strings. Amicus flinches back, feeling a chill run up his spine as he tries to stop himself from dropping the human he knows so well. Foolishness. Marco stares at him with an expression that Amicus has never seen him make before. It's cold, and almost dismissive, an expression Amicus has never seen him make before. How does this situation, in which the lives of trillions of sapients teeter on the brink of annihilation, call for such childish statements? Tell us, in what universe would attempts to avoid such a catastrophic outcome be considered foolishness? The human suddenly tilts his head in an unnatural way, leaning in closer to the wolf and Amicus gasps, setting a large paw against Marco's face, trying to stop the strange, inhuman movements. Stop that! Don't hurt him! The human holds the position for a moment, then seems to slowly relax back into the wolf's arms. Amicus feels his heart pounding in his chest. He'd provoked... 
well, not even anger from the parents. Maybe just annoyance. Yet the experience had been terrifying. Seeing Marco twist and contort in such ways was unnerving, sure. But the parents had meant to do it, and the wolf is beginning to realize why they're using Marco as a puppet. Anger and fear battle for control over the wolf before the latter finally wins out, remembering what type of decision he might have to make. Please, there must be another way. I can't... I can't choose between these two things. There's a pause in the air, and Amicus feels his knee is about to give out, preparing to throw himself at the imaginary feet of these monolithic beings. He'd beg until the end of time, woven pride be damned. What decision do you speak of? Amicus glances up again at the, at the stars. The... The decision presented to Drusus, the one decided for him by Mira ten million ten millennia ago. Amicus frowns, knowing that the parents already know what he's talking about, becoming further distressed that they're making him vocalize things that are so obvious. Oh, Amicus, don't you know the proclivity of your own people to twist and distort, to aggrandize and romanticize the truth? Amicus is quiet, waiting, heart still hammering, still simply feeling numb at this point. Do not rely on woven myth to inform you of, of parental intention. Only we will speak the truth to you. Amicus lets out a little growl, anger overcoming fear again. Then what is it? Why torment me like this? Several moments of silence pass and Amicus growls again, frustrated at the way he is being treated, how his emotions are being manipulated and sculpted like, mold, like a, mold of a mound of clay. This isn't what he'd been taught at all. Had his father known the parents to be like this? His grandfather? Amicus wishes that he'd been warned somehow. As the silence drags on, the wolf tries to deaden his emotions to not give these entities any sort of hint as to what they might be feeling, wanting to refuse this blatant attack on his own agency, despite how futile he knows that must be. You can bring back your lover. At this very moment, time stands nearly still on your plane. Marco's body and mind are still salvageable. Amicus's heart feels as though it might leap from his mouth, his hold on Marco tightening. How? But only if you submit yourself to the benevolent will of the parents. Mm, no! Uh, that worked really well for us last time. <laughs> the same question again. Oh, I don't know how I feel about them at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's... They're, they're, not, they're not gods. They're, they're gods to us only in the sense that they have advanced technology that we don't necessarily understand. And yeah. in that way, come off that way to us. They obviously have their own motives, whatever that dark thing is in the distance that's like eating the eating the galaxy or whatever it is. But no, they definitely don't. Um, they're, they're, they're making it a point to not be up front with us at all, which is really frustrating. They're kind of t like talking amicus in circles, which is even more frustrating because amicus is a very simple man with a very simple wish. Yeah. And they're not really like... They're not listening to him and his wants at all. They're just kind of talking around him. It's, uh, it's, this is overwhelming. First of all, like, we've, like, we've full-on gone to an element of the story that I don't talk about that much because it's spoilers until it comes up, but, like, there's, there's a cosmic horror element to this game. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, you are at the, you are just, like, at the whims of these seemingly ever powerful unknowable creatures like, that are controlling everything you know it's like it's the reason why you haven't had choices throughout the game like from the beginning of the game you were kidnapped against your will and then even the person who did it wasn't really making their own choices and then throughout the entire game the only choices you get to make are how you feel about things these these uh these beings that don't even like present themselves in a way that we can understand or or, or maybe are just refusing to uh, or throughout the entire story, I've had the knowledge of what was going to happen and what can happen, and yeah. of all the, all of these things. So even just to us as as like the player, they are the most powerful figure in the entire game. So to have to exist in a world like Amicus does, 
where there is like a civilization of people, things, whatever they are, that just has the upper hand of knowing absolutely everything is a horrifying concept because yeah. you will never really know if your choices are your choices, if they are guiding you in any kind of way. And the way they treat you is so callous. It's like, this is a game where absolutely everyone betrays you. Like, just everyone, except for maybe Virginia, I guess. Well, I mean, like, I, I, like, I guess Am well, Amicus doesn't really betray us. I mean, he kidnaps us, sure. Everyone but. betrays you, or they become the opposite of what you originally thought, because you'd start off not having a good opinion of Neferu. Uh, but no, Amicus repeatedly betrays you, not mm. not just, I don't just mean the kidnapping, I mean, like, the way he keeps betraying your trust, because he keeps thinking that he knows oh. better for what to do for you. Yeah, yeah. And, it keeps, and that keeps happening over and over again. He betrays us even if his intentions are good. Yeah. And then you have what Alexios does, and you have what Kato does, and Cassie. It's like, all these people have wronged you in all these different ways. But then you literally, like, the one thing that can kind of push you through this stuff and give you some sort of hope is that there is this almost literal deity that promises you that you're on the right path and that this is going to work if you just have faith and you just commit. And then that's just the final betrayal. It's like you find out when it's too late that they lied to you. Well, even at the, I mean, f for what I assume are their own means, but at the very end, like even when things were going horribly wrong in the amphitheater, they keep telling us like, oh, this is the right path. And it gets to the point yeah. where you're thinking to yourself, how can this be to keep urging <laughs> the right you, path? Like, you're, how is like this, this is it, like you're going to save Amicus and it's all going to work finally. And this is why you're here. And you were here to die. Yes. Like you were chosen to die. <laughs> and they st and they told you to your face that you could prevent this. And that was just a lie. It wasn't even like obfuscation or anything. It was explicitly a lie. You will, no matter what you do, no matter what choices you make, you always end up with your throat slit open and you die in, in the lap of your friend and the arms of your lover. I, I had my, uh, like, I started having, like, specific doubts. I mean, I, I'm hesitant about any anything that's supposed to be a deity anyway, but yeah. I, was, I was really hesitant with the, the story of Drusus and Mira, right? Mira? Yeah. Because I kept, I was thinking to myself, why is that? Why was that in this story presented as a choice? Like, in what situation would it matter if your lover dies? Why does that, why is like the safety of your world contingent on that? You know what I mean? And at no, at no point was it clear from like the parents why Mira dying would be the thing that prevent their world from failing. Yeah. Why? Like, why is that a? Why? Why make an ultimatum like that? Like, why make a person make that decision? It's not as if, like, at least in like a situation like, like life is strange or like a like butterfly effect or something. It like basically you're they present you with an alternate reality which which conflicts with the current one, and that's the problem. It's not even as if like some magical thing from the sky says you have to make this choice between A and B. In those situations, it's like because there's a conflict between alternate realities, they both can't exist. And that makes more sense in kind of like a, um, like it is a, there's no involvement. In this situation to present, like whatever, like why was Drusus presented with an A and B choice from something that's supposed to be yeah. omnipotent? And they're hinting, they're omni and they're hinting that that story is like right. obfuscated in some way. But what we've learned about Marco here is that the entire reason he's here and exists in the story, it wasn't to save Amicus in that moment, it was basically to control him. Well, like the, to give him a reason to... To submit. Yes. So like the parents specifically took this wolf that was gay and had been hurt before and specifically set him up with an outsider that he could trust and they could fall in love with and like just walked him up to his door basically and then just like completely created this scenario that leads to them falling in love and the entire story of this game happening just so they could do this where they can dangle his life as a threat well i'm sure that's what they did to drusus so i'm saying it's, yeah. like, it's like you know mira being sick like why was that necessary and i know people don't like people don't like when you talk about uh religion to point out the oh like what why did they make mira sick in the first place if they have all that power because you know there's, yeah. there's usually like oh well these things happen for reasons and i hate that argument so much yeah but <laughs> a, a thing that amicus says in this game yeah i know that's uh which is devastating in its own way but but, but frankly i can't i can't find a scenario i, I can't find a uh, this could have been avoided 
in a whole bunch of other ways. Marco could have just been here as Amicus's lover, and Amicus could have still gotten the throne if not for like X, Y, and Z circumstances. But you think that the parents, if they were smart enough, would find other ways to prevent? Like you don't have to. You didn't have to kill a person to make this happen. It's weird because they essentially. The parents essentially, it feels like they essentially heard the idea that like the most powerful force is love, which is such an optimistic and beautiful thing to make your story about. And they, they were like, oh, we'll, sa we'll save the entire emperor, empire and stuff with love. Love that we manufacture and control and use to control the person that's in control of everything. <laughs> like it's the darkest interpretation of that exact narrative beat. It's just, it's I mean, just distressing. To be completely fair, that really is. Like yeah. the honestly, probably the most. Like if, if you're looking at this in a completely, uh, it's like how do you un, most effectively un, remove all the choices from the emperor? You do so with love. Yeah, if you want to be really efficient and not have any emotion in this, and you're going to be a civilization that's like that, you'll say, okay, what is of all the scenarios I can create, what's going to be the most effective? Oh, like you know, dangling a, a cute boy as a carrot <laughs> <laughs> to get him to do what we want him to do. Ugh. And then having something horrible happen to the person you love the most is really effective as far as, like, do this or this will happen. You know, like, haha. -ha. <laughs> well, enjoy, enjoy how grim this is, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's very. Mm -hmm.